Welcome to Moving Conversations, a podcast for movement professionals by movement professionals. If you coach, train, or teach movement, Pilates, or fitness, then this podcast is for you. With more than 60 years of experience in fitness and Pilates, your hosts, Brian Ritchie and Nora St. John, explore the science of human movement, diving deep into the facts, myths, and common misconceptions, hoping to spark a thought and conversation about how we view fitness and movement. Now, let's jump into Moving Conversations. And welcome back to Moving Conversations. I'm Brian Ritchie. Joining me as always is Nora St. John. Good morning, Nora. How are you doing? Hey, Brian. Well, you know, it's that pollen time of year. So I got a little <laughs> bit of <clears throat> stuff going on. So I apologize if I sound a little funky, but uh, otherwise I'm great. I've been sneezing us up a storm. One of my yeah. employees has sneezed a minimum of 10 times a day. Oh, and God. I've been about five. And it's just, it's nonstop. We keep thinking... <laughs> When is this going to end? Today, the la- yesterday mm. and today have been dr- sort of drizzly, and I keep hoping that the water is going to tame that down. Yeah. Uh, but what's interesting, we've recorded a lot of these podcasts based on our availability. We've been available a lot more yeah. during the yeah, spring, yeah. which is awesome. We've caught up and yeah. we're ahead a little bit. So by the time people listen to this, it's going to be – June, July, it'll be summertime. So people are going to be thinking, what are you talking about spring? What are you talking about pollen? You might, you might be at the beach for all we know. Exactly. You might might listen to this on the, on the plane flight over to Italy where everybody, I think, I think everybody I know is going to Italy this summer again. Oh, geez. (laughs) That's one place I've never been. And I, I'm looking forward to it. And someday, someday I think I will. Absolutely. Ah, well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about assessments. You Mm -hmm. came into... DC and we recorded a bunch of stuff. And one of the things we recorded about was assessments. And we thought it'd be great to talk about it on the podcast, but we did more of a generalized assessment technique, uh, need for it, et cetera. And I was thinking, well, why don't we get a little bit more specific? Because something that I see in a lot of gyms and a lot of things is postural assessments. Yes. Yeah, static postural assessment. Like yeah. where does somebody stand, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I thought that'd be an interesting topic for us to cover. You know, the need for it. Why are we doing it? Is there a need? And what happens when we take that into motion, how that changes the body? Right. So yeah, why don't we go from there? So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with um a little controversy, maybe. There's been for some people, uh like posture is the thing, right? Posture Mm -hmm. is like, as long as they correct the posture, then that's really the lens into correcting movement and correcting somebody's ability to function well. For other people, um, and there's some studies that were like, posture makes no difference whatsoever. And I'm not quoting studies, but there was was some, a a lot of discussion about the value of postural assessment versus, you know, does it have a value? Does it not have a value? And I think, I think we need to get into that a bit uh, and then you know, talk specifically about it. But certainly in my experience, and I'm just going to speak from my experience and Ryan can speak from his, um, static postural assessment is one piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle by any means no. because people can stand in a way that implies certain things about their movement. And then when you take them into a dynamic assessment where they're actually moving, uh, mm-hmm. they may look completely different. So, yep. and, and, and what you think you saw in the static assessment may not show up in the dynamic assessment. So, but, but that doesn't mean that that static assessment doesn't have value in terms of getting a first view or some first ideas about a client and what you might be doing with them. Absolutely. I'm, I find the same thing when you, first of all, anytime we do an assessment and we covered this in the assessment episode, we're people pleasers. So you have someone stand yes. there yes. and, you know, I try and make them wiggle and march and do things and then just relax your body. Well, you see that they're, they feel like they're being watched. And as soon as someone's watched, Whoop. they get taller, their shoulders go back. And I'm like, relax, stop correcting yourself. And it's almost impossible not to want to correct that to a certain degree. And now, yeah, absolutely. you know, to be honest, they can try all they want. They're never going to get perfect posture. Some bodies just are not going to attain that because they've spent so many years in bad posture that they can get closer, but they yeah. they can't get perfect posture today. Maybe yeah. maybe a year down the road or after some intense work, possibly. Uh, but just taking a look at their posture, at least from my point of view, I find it 
uh, a helpful tool at the beginning, mm-hmm. just because I can see what what stands out. Yeah, exactly. What major like, stuff? Like you, like you're talking about what is it, the ten foot rule or the ten seconds, yeah. or ten feet rule, or whatever it is. Exactly. Right, where it's like, what do I see when? And and a couple of things I want to say about that. One is very often I'm doing that static postural assessment without telling them what I'm doing. Yes. So for example, I'm just saying, hey, just, you know, stand there for a moment or take a walk around the room or something or go over there or I watch them when they come in because I'm actually trying to catch them unawares. Yes. I'm trying to catch them, you know, when they're like, or maybe ideally if they're standing and talking to another client, that's my best bet. Because yeah. that's typically when they're they're kind of more relaxed they're and they're also their energy is coming out the way it would be coming out if they're talking to somebody. And that's mm-hmm. when that's when I really see it. So a lot of times I'm yes, I may do it more formally, but I also try to do it surreptitiously because that'll often like give that. me more information. I like that. And yeah, it it definitely, definitely. If you could even keep them talking, yes. you know, I, I'll sometimes say, yeah. you know. And I prefer to do it from behind rather than in front because people can yeah. sense that they're being watched. Yeah. So absolutely. I'll say, face yourself in the mirror and I'll look like I'm just, I, I just need to jot something down. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm actually w- looking at them going, yep. oh, duh, 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 duh. and yep, again, yep, 10 yep. seconds is not long. It's usually when I say, okay, now turn to the side. And they're like, oh, I'm be, and that's when they realize they're being watched <laughs> right, a little bit. Right. And I've tried, I've tried to walk around them a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. But that's usually when they realize and it's like, oh, and you see them begin to pull their head back and their shoulders back and whatnot. Yeah. And again, I just say, just relax. It's just, to me, it's a snapshot of yeah. today. Yeah. Of this moment. Of yeah. And that's, that's the important thing to remember of this moment. Yeah. If I took this a week ago yep. or a week from now with or without exercise, I may see something different based on how they slept last night. How many times have I had a client come in and their heads cocked a little funny and I'll say everything. Okay. I said, man, I just slept funny. My neck is a little, Mm -hmm. but because they have their head cocked a little weird, all of a sudden, if I saw that in a client of, of during a postural assessment, I mean, Oh, wow. Look at that on there. Yeah. What's going on there? What's happening? But it may be very temporary. Yeah. One other thing that I really want to, pound on a bit is there is no perfect posture. All right. There is not like uh, one of the real challenges I find in a lot of postural training and things is there is this, you know, this plumb line, magical, everybody should look like this um, implication under it. That is just, it is, um, it's just wrong. I mean, really it's just wrong because I've worked with a million people with a million different structures that are not ideal posture in any way that are, you know, very functional to high level functional. You know, I think about, I I mentioned this a lot, but I think of a lot of the swimmers I've worked with, except with a lot Mm -hmm. of synchronized swimmers and competitive swimmers, their posture is kind of funky. Mm -hmm. You know, usually their, their static posture is often a little funky, a little odd, but that's works for them in terms of being high level performers. Um, and even yep. just people who are or, my ordinary folk who just have a deeper lordotic curve or a little more kyphosis or a slightly forward head, or, uh, you know, they shift over to one side. Like there's all kinds of just very normal things that can still be quite functional and quite fine. So it's not like even yep. when I see those variations and I'm trying to get them to some sort of ideal in my mind, mm-hmm. I'm really trying to look and see how those deviations, if you want to talk, call them that, or those, or that lack of symmetry, which is sometimes how I also think about it. How is that serving them? Like, is it serving them or is it causing trouble? And, or is That's it neutral? the key? Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. When you mentioned deep lordotic curve, you and I both know someone who has a very deep lordotic curve that mm-hmm. you wouldn't know just by looking at them until they stand and you're like, oh, interesting. That's Mm -hmm. a pretty deep curve. And we've seen people with kyphosis. We've seen people with forward head carriage. And what I always do is I look at all these things and I mark them down. Yeah. And I'm now going to compare and contrast in my mind with the things that they've talked about. So if they, if they've got a lot of roundedness in the shoulders and they're suffering from, you know, some kind of shoulder Neck problem, shoulder neck problem, problem carpal right. tunnel, elbow tendonitis, right? right? Anything happening, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to look up the chain and maybe maybe there's something I can work on there that might change the rest of it. Exactly, exactly. And that's what is going to do it for me. 
if yeah. I see they have a big sway back posture where their rib cage sits behind their hip bones when they stand, okay, that causes a lot more compression and it changes their center of gravity. Okay, their hips are sho shoved forward. They've got low back pain. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that could be contributing to it. Right. I'm not going to, and again, it's not my job. I always say it, we're sort of body detectives. Yes. But at the same time, it's not my job to diagnose. It's my job to notice and say, well, maybe, maybe not, exactly. but it's a place to maybe start. And if we begin correcting some of that, oh, the pain's going away. Okay. I may be on the right track or it's not touching it at all. Well, okay. It's might be something Fine. else. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. I mean, that's, that's what our work always is, is, is creating a potential hypothesis like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe, maybe they're having some neck and shoulder problems because they seem to have a really forward head and they happen to be an accountant, right? And yep. they're working at a computer all day. Well, yep. okay. That seems like a logical place to start. So we start working on that. Things get better. Okay. I'm on the right track. I continue on or absolutely nothing changes. Let's look elsewhere. Maybe it's from the mm -hmm. lower body. Maybe it's from how they're holding their hands. You know, maybe it's their ergonomic situation. Maybe it's how they sleep. So you yep. got to look for some other things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important. I want to mm -hmm. sort of push on this. It's important to look at all the different variables. This is a single yeah. variable. Yep. Yep. And while it may be a highlighted one when you're mm -hmm. looking at it because they have an issue and you're like, ooh, that could be a big part of it. It yep. could be. Yep. But again, you've talked about, you know, your client that you used to have that had that really low slung car to the ground yeah, that was in a yeah. deep, you know, deep flexed posture <laughs> right. driving in this low car for long period for periods of time on the weekend. Well, I don't care what their posture looks like. That was exacerbating his condition more so than just a static posture. Yes, so absolutely. Absolutely. It's important to look at all the variables and be able to say, yep. okay, what variables are important? What aren't? you know, and just look at all of them. And if we can correct others like ergonomics or, you know, change their, the position of I'm looking at the camera right now. Well, what if my camera was down there and I had to stare down all day long? Well, uh -huh. do you think my neck might bother me by the end of the day? Uh, a likely thing. Yeah. So you move it up and suddenly, oh, I can stand in better posture. I can sit up in better posture and, you know, address my meetings or wherever, whoever I'm talking to online. So there are things that can be changed very simply that may have a profound effect on that. So again, it's just one variable. I want to use uh, one client's story, which which is purely which was purely a postural correction that made a big difference. I mean, they meant this before, but uh, one of my clients was um, she actually was the owner of a large uh, greeting card company. So she went to a lot of publicity events and meetings and parties and that kind of thing. And uh, her general posture was basically kind of sway back. So very posteriorly tilted, slung back, weight kind of on her heels, a little bit rounded forward with her shoulders. And she had a lot of low back pain. And she said when she stood for more than, you know, 10 or 15 minutes that her back would really start to hurt. And this was problematic because she had to stand at parties and things a lot. So <clears throat> I basically said, well, why don't you just think about basically tilting your pelvis forward <laughs> and standing a little more with the weight in your ball, your feet, just, you know, shift those simple things. Yep. And, um, uh, two days later, she was at a party for another, and she said, yeah, I, I could, I was there for 45 minutes instead of 20 minutes before things started to, to get irritated. So that was, that was where that uh, value of recognizing a postural pattern, especially one that was a static postural pattern that was causing her pain because she was holding that static postural pattern while she was doing stuff, right? Because she had yeah. to stand a lot, was, was like, just like, boom, boom. That was one of those really quick little uh, moments of success. And, yep. and that's something that's, you know, that's, that can be really useful. Uh, it can be again. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that, that, but in this case, that's because it, it related directly to the function she was trying to do, which was stand for a long period of time. And what's interesting, you said the perfect word for this awareness. Yeah. Getting them aware of their own posture. Most people, when I do my postural assessments, you know, a lot after I, you know, take that quick glance, yeah. I'll talk to them about it and I'll say, yeah. here's what I saw. You know, and I say, I, I don't know what this means yet, but here's what I saw. Right, right. And for the most part, I can't tell you how many times people say, wow, really? And especially something like a lateral shift where their shoulders sit yeah. on their hip, over their hips to the side. And I'll put them in front of the mirror and I say, just take a look at how your arms hang. One's in front of your body and the other's got swinging to the side. And they're like, oh my gosh, I never noticed that I do that. 
And I say, look, probably it's environmental. Maybe the way you've sat on the couch, we all have our spot. You know, right. yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I watch Big Bang Theory and Sheldon has his spot. Well, you know what? Everybody has <laughs> their spot that they like to sit on. And the way and they a, like to sit. And the way they like to sit. Yeah. And I actually had a spot in a sofa and it was, a uh, okay, it was an Ikea sofa. The thing was built like a brick out house. I mean, you could not break this thing. But I had it for, I don't, I don't even know how many years, years, years and years and years. And Eventually, I sat on the other side of the sofa one day. I don't know why. And I thought, why am I sitting so high? I, and then I actually tipped the sofa over and went, wow, over the years, that part of the sofa had dipped down. I had actually literally bent some of the bolts. I mean, we're talking years and years. And it caused my whole body to sort of lean and shift over onto the arm of the sofa. It was very comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> right. But... Did that affect my posture possibly? Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah, I would yeah, yeah. spend an hour, two hours, whatever it is at night sitting there yeah. watching TV or whatever. Yeah. And it's the same thing with women. I find women sling one hip to the side uh, yeah. more than the other if they've had children because one side is yeah. where they carried that kid on their hip for years. Yeah. And it, their kid's now going to college, but they still have that shift. And if, if they don't have kids, it's the purse. It's the you purse know, or the backpack purses, or... or the backpack and, and they tend to carry it on one side and then their ribs will just shift over to that side and, yep. um, you know, all those little things. <clears throat> yep. And it's, it's really, they're unaware of yeah. where their body is in space. I mean, most people are, if you ask them, they really don't understand. And when you put them into their body and even just asking something simple, you could try this with your next client when you see them, or you could try it with your spouse, just say, where are Where's your weight on the ball, on your feet, on the mm -hmm. balls of your feet or in your heels? And you're going to see they're going, their eyes will shift up to the sky and they're going to be like, let me think. And it's like, wow, really? You have to think about that. It's not just an automatic because they don't know where their body is in space. I also, I would use a funny example here because, you know, when mm -hmm. we're on video and there's always like, you know, improve my appearance on Zoom videos. Yeah. And, and I feel like we have that filter in our mind. Yeah. Many of us. I mean, some people see, you know, something much worse than they are when they look in the mirror. But a lot of people look in the mirror, they remember how they looked when they were 22. And somehow that's still the image that comes up. <laughs> right. Because, because you know, more than one client, like, like a really many more than one client, uh, I, I've started to talk to them about their posture. And maybe they're very forward head or they're very round shouldered or whatever the situation is. And, and they come to me a few days later or something, and they say, wow, you know, I was walking down the street, and I happened to catch a glance in the mirror, right, in the, in the window, in the reflection in the window as I was walking by. You are so right. My, what is like what? My posture is terrible. But even, even if they had seen that same picture a hundred other times, They'd I register. really do think we just put the filter in and it's like, mm, I, I look great, or whatever it is, or they just don't yep. see it. Right. So, so awareness is definitely key. Like, what am I doing? Where is my body? I don't know. I mean, most of us don't spend much time thinking about it. <clears throat> I was talking with a client who had that exact thing happen to them, but you know how some stores have a 45 degree uh, window as you're going to walk into the store. Yeah. And as you're walking by that 45 degrees, if you glance yeah. at it, well, suddenly you're walking into yourself. Right. Right. He actually right. told me he saw that and he started to get out of the way for the old man walking it, walking toward him. <laughs> And, oh, and he said, yeah. I can't believe. And then I realized that was me. Yeah. He said, I don't see myself as that. And I mean, yes, yeah. the yeah. guy was in his early seventies and whatnot, but in his mind, he felt in his fifties, he felt still exactly. young and fairly vibrant. Exactly. Yep. And then, yep, but yep. he's like, I guess I'm not that guy anymore. I was <laughs> like, well, you know, that's a good realization. I'm not 20 anymore either. So <laughs> So exactly. I mean, this is this is just the nature of it. So getting getting aware of posture is, is one of those you know important things, and it really does help you to understand where you are and what you're doing. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about what we see in a postural assessment, what we're kind of looking for, and what some of it means. Okay. Right. So so first things first is I always look for just general symmetry, and mm -hmm. I'm usually looking front and back symmetry across the midline. And one of the things I say about symmetry is and there's been a lot of studies about this, humans have a very natural appreciation for symmetry. 
Yes. Uh, that, that our eye will like, there was, I, I quote this study a lot, but basically they had somebody sitting in a room, presumably, and they would flash very, very, very short images of faces, uh, a whole bunch of them in a row. And they had to push a button that said that face was beautiful. That face was not beautiful. Mm-hmm. And they're like, like within, you know, within milliseconds. And basically when they correlated beauty and not beauty to the faces on the screen, symmetry was beautiful and non-symmetry was not. Yes. And, and, and that they made that judgment within seconds, within like less than seconds of seeing an image pop up. So our natural ability to recognize symmetry is built in, it's hardwired. So, mm-hmm. you know, you as an, as a movement professional, you movement professionals out there, this is not something that you, ha- you may have to pay attention to it, but it's not something you don't innately have, mm-hmm. right? So when people say, how do you see that? Because people, I'm sure I know people, I've seen people ask you, how do you see that? How do you know yeah. that? You know, people ask me that too. And it's like, like some of that is just, just paying attention. Like you actually yeah. have an ability to see that. All of us do. You just have to pay attention and recognize it. Yeah. No, no question when you, and that's one reason why that lateral shift, when you're looking at someone from behind and looking right to left side, you can see, well, one side is either tilted up or one side is very different than the other. And yeah, the it could shoulders be any, high or there's yeah. no space between the ribs and the side and the arm on one side yep. or the or hips, hips are shifted out to up. one yep. side. Yeah. All those. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or a foot and an- one ankle is turned in or the knee yep. is turned in. All of these things we can see and it's sort of, huh? Okay. And these are things, again, we're not diagnosing. We're not doing anything. We're just noticing. Yeah, exactly. We're just paying attention. Just and, paying and, attention. And, and, and in my notes, it's like, you know, I have a little, like a, I have outline of a person front, back and side, just a little like outline. And I, I'm, I'm an arrow drawer. So it's like, you know, arrow head mm. going forward, ribs going back, you know, deep curve, rib shifted to the right like i'll just i'll arrow arrow the whole thing so i just get a sense of where things are in their body relative to you know some mythical plumb line exactly exactly i'm not a fan of the plumb line just in general because yeah. people's centers of gravity are all change different. as we age yeah yeah and a large person versus a small person is going to have a very different one just where they carry their weight yeah. Because if I have more weight anteriorly, it's going to, I'm going to probably shift posteriorly a little bit just for counterbalance. Yeah. Uh, someone who's more muscular is going to be different than someone who's very slight. Mm-hmm. So we can't just take that plumb bob, you know, plumb line and apply it to every single person. Mm-hmm. For me, it's more of along the lines of, does it look fairly, do they look fairly straight when they stand to the side. If I'm looking from the side, front yeah. to back, yeah. do they look pretty straight, you know, or right. does their head really look like it's forward or do their shoulders right. really look rounded or something like that? Again, or their hips really back up? or something, right? What, like, like, like just, just a rough, because it's also, um, you the plumb line implies that all of our structures are the same. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I always think about with, with the plumb line is, uh, and this is, you know, looking at the rib cage, for example, right. Right. I mean, if somebody has a deeper rib cage front to back, there's kind of that center of balance is going to be different over their pelvis. And somebody has a very, very shallow rib cage. Right. Or or less, you know, if their spine, all those all those things are just going to change where that center of gravity needs to be for that particular client. Yep. You know, yep. Yeah. And, and I mean, you and I use each other, uh, you know, yeah, because we're very example. different bodies. I've got a gigantic rib cage. You've got a much smaller rib cage. You know, uh, my <laughs> pelvis is like out here and yours is much more narrow. And so seeing two different bodies, you know, side by side, you can really see, you know, and even when we had your brother in, when we were doing the uh, yeah, assessments the here, assessment. yep. we were very different standing there where we're both nearly six feet tall. You know, I'm a little over, mm-hmm. he was a little, we were similar ish in height yep. and how we carried ourselves how long torso, how, sh- you know, long legged, yep. how yep. we carried our bodies yep. really was different. And you can't compare the two of us. It's just not going to work. No, it, And it's, this is one of those things that is, it's actually kind of obvious, but uh, not always acknowledged, which is, is there harmony within that structure? Mm. Right. Because, and, and this, this gets to that kind of, it's not really woo-woo because it's not actually woo-woo. If you look at a structure that looks at ease 
in standing, right? You'll just mm -hmm. look at it and it's just, you know, they're at ease, they're comfortable, they're relaxed. You don't see any stress building up anywhere. Other people you look at and even just standing, you see like, oh, like low back tension or you yep. see shoulder tension or you see uh, something else that looks, there's just stress in the body, right? They're not, they're just not comfortable standing there or their, their knees are really locked back and hyperextended, for example. Yep. Um, so so you'll, you'll see those tension moments and some clients you don't see any tension moments. Yep. And, and again, that, that's tuning in, that's paying attention, but it doesn't take much uh, observation of just ordinary folk. And, and one of the things I love about postural assessment is you can do it anywhere, anytime. Anytime. And, you know, when I was a new teacher, uh, I used to live in, in Oakland and I was, uh, there was a, a lake, Lake Merritt I used to uh, live next to. And I would just go down and sit on a bench and watch people walk by. And, you know, you see everything and you see the bodies that look really just harmonious and everything's moving smoothly and graceful. And the bodies that are so awkward, you're wondering how they actually are getting around the lake. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and, and you, and you, and that it doesn't take much to notice that you just have to like pay attention and you, and you recognize that body's moving well, that body's not moving well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I tell people that all the time when instructors come up and they want to know how I see the body. It's like, okay, go to the mall. Yeah. Go Start like looking. you go to the lake. Watch. Yep. Well, wh what will I, if I don't know the person, I won't know what's wrong. I say, you don't need to. No. Just watch because yeah. just looking at the body, they rotate easier to one side than the other. Okay. Yep. That doesn't tell me anything. It yep. just tells me what I see. Yeah. I jot it down. Yep. And in looking at posture, it's the same thing. So I see a rib shift to one side. Okay. Jot it down. Interesting. It's that it's that it's it's interesting. Interesting. Like note, you know? that, note, note. Yeah. And what I find the postural assessment does more than anything else, and it goes back to your symmetry when you're looking side to side, front to back, is just I'm looking for muscular imbalances. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you can see, especially in the spine, if I do see a rib shift, it's like, okay, when I have them in all fours or if I have them lie on their stomach, I'll be able to, you know, sometimes put my hands on their back and see if one side of their erectors is really inflamed, you know, is really more pronounced, hypertrophy, more hypertrophy. Yeah, it's bigger in some way. Yeah, it's a bigger, you know, yeah. it's a bigger tenderloin. One side has more meat. <laughs> you know, you're feeling that you're like, okay, this side's a little bit bigger. You know, but that might tell me, okay, I need to work on stretching this side a little bit more or strengthening the other side a little bit more. And knowing those muscular imbalances in my brain is just like, okay, we just need to balance out the system to try and create that harmony. Right. And again, with rotation, maybe they rotate really easily to one side and the other side, boom, they stop. Okay. I wonder why. Let's see. Can they even rotate? Oh, they can. Okay. Let's start focusing a little bit on that. Uh, or whatever they they need for their body to get that way. And when you mentioned harmony, it's interesting you say that. I had a client yesterday who she has a very interesting body in that her shoulders are way up high all the time. Mm. She's having cervical issues, but it's like her tension level in her neck, inner cervical, inner scalenes and everything never, ever, ever lets go. Mm -hmm. Even at rest, even, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't for the life of me, if I push down on her shoulders, they're not going down. It's almost no. as though that's just where her structure is. Uh -huh. But with all the other issues she has cervically, there's something telling me that there's probably overly tight and we work on flexibility and mobility and all of that, as well as some strengthening of the right muscles. But in looking at it, it was sort of, huh, why is it so elevated all the time? And it just doesn't want to go down. So it's just one of those things like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. And again, I, again, I've had her for a while and she's, she's experienced more discomfort in her neck since traveling and things. So we're focusing a little bit on cervical issues more now. So it's like, okay, again, I don't have to know why, but I noticed it again. I jotted it down and I said, okay, let's see where this is a month from now when we're doing supposedly the right things, does yeah. it change? Yeah. Does it not change? Yeah. And if it doesn't, maybe we have to start thinking about something else or maybe it's just her structure. She was born that way. And that tension line just isn't going to go anywhere. It's part of our, our hypothesis and then test you, know, you test it, right? You make a hypothesis and then you, yep. you go down a path based on what you're thinking might be happening. 
And then yep. you, you know, it, it's like that decision tree. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, that's working. That's not. So that means I'm going to explore more about, let's say the mobility of her thoracic cage, right. Or something like yep. that, or her breathing pattern or what's happening in the front of her chest. Like, is that why the shoulders are coming up? Right. So you kind of have, I, I always find I have multiple paths available in my brain, like little decision tree moments. And I go down one and maybe that, maybe that works or maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Then I hop to my next one and maybe that works, yep. maybe it doesn't. And, or maybe it works kind of, but I've got to refine it. And that's really that, that process. And postural assessment is just that beginning step. <clears throat> right. And again, in, in an assessment after the, I do my medical history with them and sit down and find out all their backstory. That's when the postural assessment takes place. Now I'm not going to say I'm not looking at their posture the entire time they're sitting in front of me because I am. Exactly. I'm constantly analyzing when they walk in. Uh, but when I do the so-called static uh, postural assessment, the formal one, uh, you know, comes that, that next step because I do want to see what do I just see hopefully with their body mostly at rest. Mm -hmm. But something that we just, we haven't really talked about is the difference between static versus dynamic. What happens once that body gets in motion? Right. And I want to use, I want to use an example of that. Cause I think about two clients. Um, I think about two, two clients, both of whom in the static assessment without knowing anything else about them, mm -hmm. they were both relatively kyphotic shoulders forward, head forward. Mm -hmm. So if I was just to put them in, you know, if I was to put the two of them side by side, I would consider the pattern quite similar. Okay. Which, you know, that's not uncommon, but this was the difference. One of them, um, one of them was extremely stiff. So her kyphosis, like she really, she could barely, uh, in terms of the mobility of her spine, she really couldn't straighten up. Mm. Like her, she just, she barely had, she really, uh, she really didn't even have neutral um, thoracic extension. Okay. It was just really stiff. So we had to work a lot on thoracic mobility in her case and head and stuff, but a lot of, a lot of th thorax. This, the other client looked it looked just the same but in her case it was a collapsed posture she was so mobile oh. in her thorax that her natural position was to collapse into her mobility but she had the ability to come into actually rather extreme thoracic extension so that's so, so for me i want to bring that up because that's where the static yeah. posture kind of breaks down as you look at that and that tells you something but it doesn't always tell you, like it tells you what they do when they're like what their habit is when they're standing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily tell you what their potential is when they're moving. Right. 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 And so that's just I kind of want to bring that up when you talk about, um, you know, how 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 things go from dynamic from static to dynamic. I love that story because it's very true. You don't know how a body's going to move when you're looking at it in a static position, no. because we've seen I've had dancers here. Uh, yeah. I've had people who are, I tell the story when I teach sometimes about, uh, one of my clients, Phil, uh, former client, uh, he's from England, from London, uh, filmmaker, great, great guy. First time he came in to me, I would say he was just your typical Brit, you know, kind of pudgy looking, never really took fitness too seriously, you know, as an adult, he was active, but he never really lifted, you know, heavy weights or anything like that, or took that seriously. And he mentioned that he was active and he's run marathons and everything. And my first thought was, wow, that must've been a long time ago because of the way he looked. I was making assumptions based on what I yeah. saw. Yeah. And in, and even in his postural assessment and things, he moved, he moved fairly well. Okay. And I put him on the treadmill and I walked away and the treadmill's outside my office. And so I could listen. I wanted him to warm up and I was hearing the treadmill go, but I wasn't hearing him on it. Oh. I wasn't hearing his feet. And I was like, that punk is just standing there. He's uh. not on the machine. Uh. So I gave him a minute thinking maybe he's tying his shoe. No, 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 no. I'm not hearing anything. And I walk out and he's running. Wow. And I'm not he was hearing that his quiet. Feet. Really? On a treadmill? He was like a gazelle. Whoa. I heard no I've never footfall. Had that experience. Uh -huh. And he was just gliding. I've never seen it before. And I said, and it, oh. it, when he said he ran marathons and I said, you are a born runner. Yeah. And he said, I've always been able to run. I, yeah, and I was really. flabbergasted, but That's again, 
you would never know it by looking at him. Again, I, you right. make assumptions when you look yes. at someone. So yeah. when you saw your client, those two clients, if all you did was look at that and you, all your programming was based on the static posture, you would have programmed them nearly identically, even though they were worlds apart. Yep, exactly. Needed completely different paths. Yeah, because we have these judgments that we naturally begin to make, you know, based on years and years and years of experience that we see someone with a forward head carriage, we kind of know some of what we're going to be dealing with, or, you know, palms are facing backwards. We know that their rotator cuff is probably going to be a little weak or whatnot. There are certain things we've seen because we've seen a million cases of them. But that doesn't mean it's going to be that way for everybody. And you really have to watch their body in motion to get the true story. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so one other thing that's like, so still like, like what other benefits do I get out of, out of static posture? So some of the other benefits that I find, again, these are just like the things that I find useful are, <clears throat> are what's happening, <clears throat> sorry, what's happening between the legs, the pelvis, and the spine. How is force mm. transferring through that fairly critical juncture? Mm -hmm. You know, are there are their hips turned out? Like, do they naturally stand with their feet turned out? Do they stand with their feet turned in? Is one leg turned out? Is one leg turned in? Um, is the pelvis, again, cocked to one side, right? Shifted over the weight to one side or rotated back on one side or lifted up on one side? Like, just, just noting those and not even that those are things that are you know, major things, but just noting how do they mm -hmm. live? How do they live in that relationship between their legs, their pelvis and their spine? Um, and that's something where I find a static assessment gives me some information, but mm -hmm. that's really where you see when they're talking to somebody or they're talking to you, where did they shift into to hang out? Yeah. That's when I get more information about that. It's still static, but like they've, they've gotten relaxed and suddenly they're shifting over to their right leg. Their hip is swinging out to the right. They're turning out their left foot. And they're shifting their ribs over to the right as well, or whatever it is, right? Then you really yep. see, ah, this may be where they actually hang out, which yep. tells you a lot about the, the muscle balance. It tells you a lot about, <clears throat> if you're interested in the anterior posterior slings or how the core is working, how the balance through the ribs and the spine and the pelvis is working, right? That'll tell you where their bias is, where their, their strength is, or where their support is, and where the support is not so strong. And what's interesting also, when you look at that, I'm sure you've seen like I have a million times when someone's just standing there, you can see where they get stuck, where uh -huh. the energy yeah. doesn't flow yes. between those parts. Because again, yep. it should go shoulders through the thoracic, down through the lumbar spine, through the hips, through the feet, legs and down, you know, through yeah. the feet. But you'll be able to see, especially I find looking from the side, Boom. One area just looks like, okay, the energy will get stuck there. Right. Low back it'll get is a classic. Low back. Or anterior exactly. hip. Anterior right? hip. Pelvis. Knee. Pelvis. Yeah, exactly. And you can see it. it's like, oh, everything's, you know, everything else looks normal, normal. Ooh, something's going on there. Yep. And then when you put them through some kind of movement, you can see, oh yeah, that's going to validate that thought process because you're like, oh yeah, you you're moving fine until there. And now you're hitting, that's the wall. Boom. You've got that brick wall. And then after it can move, but that one spot is just not moving properly. And I, I refer to it, it gets stuck. It's mm -hmm. sticky. Yeah, absolutely. And you see that in, so let's say somebody does a static assessment and then they, then they walk, you just have yes. them walk. Or in your case, you have them maybe on the treadmill doing a warm up, or they're walking across the room and then you yep. see, Oh, right. The femurs are not going into extension right there, maybe their legs are just way in front of them, or that right leg is really turning out. Or <clears throat> what I often, I often listen for and watch for in, in any kind of gate, anything is the rhythm. And you hear right. this a lot in the treadmill, boom, 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 right. They're landing heavier on the right foot or, mm -hmm. or, or I, I always, I always try to almost sing their gait to myself. I know this is goofy because sometimes <laughs> like, you know, you'll watch somebody go down the street and especially in certain neighborhoods, um, like you'll see somebody who's kind of walking with a bit of a strut. But, uh -huh. it's, but it's like a ba, da, da, ba, ba, da, da, right? There's a very asymmetrical rhythm to their uh -huh. strut. You know, like one hip's really gliding forward and the other one's like staying back and they're leading with that left side or the right side, whatever it is. Yep. Um, and, and you'll see that with a client on a more subtle level potentially, but you'll still see that. Uh, and yep. that lets me know, yes, things are not, things are not moving well through that pelvis. They're not moving evenly. They're not transferring yep. the force evenly through that area. 
And it can happen to anybody. I, when we were in Phoenix at the Pilates on tour, I had someone in one of my classes and we were doing some walking type of stuff. And this is a professional mover. And she looked like she probably was a former dancer. Her hips moved so far to one side when she walked, but to the other side, they just went bunk and sort of got uh, stuck. Like they hit a and wall. One, yeah. And one side had a natural, almost like a Shakira, you know, sway to it. And then they came back to the center and then they stopped. Bam. And yeah. they went out and then they came back and stopped. And I was watching that. And I thought that is so interesting that she had that. And we were working on trying to get the hips to move a little bit better. And as she was doing it, you could see she was trying to do it, but it just wasn't coming naturally to her. And it, it was, was sort effort. of a, it was a lot of effort was, to try like and get that Pushing into that, sl that lateral glide rather than, than it falling into that lateral glide. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was, again, if, if it was a client, that would be something I'd be like, oh, okay, we're going to, we're going to take a look there. what's happening there. Cause mm -hmm. energy is not transferring well. Right. It's definitely getting stuck. Yep. Yep. And that's what, you know, when we do the, put someone into motion, that's the kind of thing that you can see that you may or may not, you get a hint of it with a static, but mm -hmm. you may not get that precise. Oh yeah. That's the side. That's what's going on. I find, I find particularly the, the lateral, the lateral system you'll, and the rotational system, you won't see as much yep. in the static alignment. So, so the sagittal plane, I can get some pretty good tips you know, they've got some mobility in their thorax. <clears throat> they've got no mm -hmm. mobility in their lumbar. They're anteriorly tilted. Like all those things are going to, they're, they're hyperextending their knees. Those are yep. all going to tell me something. And those are really easy to see in a static assessment. But what I will often miss is what's happening with, with that lateral system. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes a uh, next step that I'll sometimes do is just have somebody sway in place, both feet on the ground, hips to the right, hips to the left. And almost immediately you'll see something like that with a lot of clients. Yep. Like they go to the right. And then they, boom, they run into the left. They go to the yep. right, boom, and they don't go to the left or vice versa, or they're, or they don't go either way. They're just stiff in both sides. So thinking about the lateral system and then rotation really is what I'm looking for a lot when they are doing something like running yep, you know, or walking, even just walking, just is there mobility of the, of the thorax? Do they rotate? <laughs> because a lot of clients, uh, especially with some of my older clients just have stopped moving their thorax altogether when they walk. Right, their legs are moving, but their torso is staying quite quite still. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. One of the things that I'll sometimes have, especially with my older clients, too, are just standing hip circles. Yeah, or yeah. side yeah. to side. Yeah, because you're going to find that I I used to do it on the ball, sitting on the ball, because the ball gave you that motion. Yeah, and I found it worked. It was great for the lumbar spine, uh -huh. but it took the hips out of it. When yeah. I got them into standing. Just going side to side, you could see yeah. people being uncomfortable. They don't go yeah. like, it's like my body doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. And then you try and have them circle. And it's like, I just want your femurs to be rotating in the sockets yep. gently. Like, what? However big you want the circle to be. And they're, they're looking at you and they're, they're thinking, how do I do this? Yep. I'm not a hula dancer. What are you making me do? Exactly. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, Wow. You can't do this. And they may be in their forties. It's not as though they're in their nineties, you know, and that's yeah. sort of a, huh? Okay. But again, it's just putting them through that motion. And like you said, you can't always see that in a static, No. in the static. All you can see is they, they look symmetrical right to left. They look symmetrical front to back. Their weight seems to be balanced. Okay. So again, I might think, oh, they're probably pretty good. Then you have them shift side to side. And you're like, ooh, something, something, something's, got, something's going on there. You yep. have them do a circle and you're thinking, wow, you go one direction really well. But mm, you sort yeah. of do, you, instead of an ellipse motion, <laughs> you're kind of doing a half circle. Okay, that's a different... <laughs> Or right, so you're making an amoeba, like that. More so like a, an amoeba, amoeba. <laughs> like we're not, we're not getting circular. We're kind of getting, you know, or or a funky starfish. It's like exactly, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, so yeah, so I find that motion is just as important because it tells me what's going on. So for me, the static assessment. And, you know, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, I just briefly want to say what I sort of look at when I'm looking at the static. Uh, yeah. You can tell me what you look at uh, from the back as well as from the side. You said you look at symmetry. I, I obviously look at that, but I want to look at the head. Does it tilt yep. side to side? 
Where is it? Yeah. Shoulder yep. is one side higher than the other. Yep. Yep. You know, is there a curvature to the spine, a C curve, an S curve, or a lateral shift? Yep. You know, and sometimes I'll even run my finger down their spine just because they may have a baggy shirt on or something it's like that. It's not always easy to see where the spine actually is. I mean, pe people no. wear clothing that is very, very unrevealing for the spine often. Yeah. And once you sort of touch the spinous process, you can pretty much feel if it's going to move. Do their hips that are one side higher than the other? Mm -hmm. You know, I look at their knees. Are they turned in? Or turned out? You know, turned out. Mm -hmm. uh, their feet, are they really bowed in? Are they, yeah. you know... Are their ankles shifted in? So I look at that from behind. And again, you can do that quickly. Mm -hmm. And from the side, forward head carriage, rounded shoulders, you know, sway back posture, anterior pelvic tilt. You know, I even look at abdominals to see, are do they just let them hang out? Is it just right. that they have no yeah. control? So it goes into our lordosis because they have no abdominal control. Right. You know, and yeah. go into that anterior tilt. Do they lock their knees? Yep. So these are just the things that I glance at for me that I see from the side, from the back that tell me that give me that quick snapshot. Then I'll take them into specific movement patterns mm -hmm. where we'll, we'll tell me more. And often what I saw in the static will either be, you know, confirmed and validated or, oh, like your person. Oh no, they have a lot more range of motion than I thought. They just need a lot more stability, strength, whatever. Right. Right, exactly. Postural to choosing a different posture instead of relaxing into their collapsed, collapsed position. Yeah, so exactly symmetry where the ribs are relative to the pelvis, where the pelvis is relative to the feet. Um, you know, all those, all those things, just, just getting a sense of where where they hold themselves. But mm -hmm. again, typically, typically in a in a static assessment, their legs are together, or at least they're in the same plane with each other. Yep. Um, <clears throat> one is not necessarily turned out. So I, I watch that. And then again, I really do like to see if I can, if I, if I can catch them getting more relaxed. We have a longer conversation. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm standing in front of them. We're just chatting about this. Just say, tell me a little bit about your story. So, you know, we finish whatever we're doing at the desk and then we stand up and start talking. Tell me a little bit about da, da, da. Let's have yep. a chat with me for a moment or two. And I'll watch them then relax into, oh, uh, okay. What I would think I was seeing in their static where the ribs shift to the right and hip, oh, yep, there they go. And that right hip's now turned out. And then, oh, okay, that, that tells me a little bit more. Again, in a very simple way. I like way. that. Yeah. No, I like that. Yeah. And I, you know, I think I do that unconsciously without even really realizing I'm, it. I know you do. I've seen you do it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I tell most of my clients, and this I find, you know, the first session, I say, look, I'm learning a lot about you. Today is, today is my official assessment of you. Mm -hmm. But our first session is going to be an assessment as well. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I said, we are people pleasers. So that first assessment, chances are you were trying without even knowing it. You were trying to please. You were trying to do things correctly. What, you, what your brain tells you is correct. Yeah. But the first time I start putting them through specific exercises, is when their brain is now having to function on a much different, higher level of doing it properly. Now I'm going to see a lot more. Absolutely. And I might see them relaxed and I might see them. Do they just collapse when they sit yep. in a chair? Do they, when they stand, do they sort of automatically hang out on one side when they're lying down? You know, do they have a huge arch to their back or does their back automatically flatten completely? You yep. know, where's their head, where's their neck, all of this kind of stuff that they may, the first time I put them, they're going to be in good, you know, good control of their body or as good as they can be. But that first session tells me so much. And that's, that's where, I, you know, I, I, for the advancement principles program, we talk about assessor sizes, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, which is basically a lot of the exercises you will typically teach a client on a first session anyway. Yep. You know, if you're trying to just understand where their pelvis is and where their legs are and what their mobility is and what their strength is, you know, all the things that you do, those are, those are generally, I, I could think of many of them as assessments and exercises. And that's, yep. that's really, that's why that second time is always it. I also say, uh, and I say this to you know when I'm teaching students too, is like that first time, whatever that first assessment is, that first day you're with them, those are all just like, hmm, note to self, hmm, maybe, maybe, maybe. It could be yep. that day. It could be, again, they're trying to please you. It could be um, something else. And and then, you know, it's it's not till I, and I don't really commit to my understanding of that until I've seen them for, mm -hmm. for three or four times. The other thing too, um, 
and I'm thinking one particular situation uh, here where I had one client who their idea of what was correct. So when they were trying to, to do the right thing, it was not the right thing. Yeah. But, and this was, this was interesting. It was a client who was actually in a Coraline class, <clears throat> an instructor, and she had been taught from, you know, a, a young woman that when you sat down, you shouldn't fold at the hips. So you're trying to do a squat with a straight back. Wow. Which is what, which she was told was more ladylike. So okay. for her, a squat was, was not acceptable, like a, a regular mm -hmm. old squat, right? Where you're folding at the hips and the knees and your shoulders are over your knees and you're, you know, you're leaning forward. Like that was unacceptable to her uh, feeling of what was proper movement. Mm -hmm. So that was just, that was just interesting to come across uh, because occasionally I found that too with, with postural assessment that somebody who's brought up a particular way or has a, you know, parent who bugs them or a, mm -hmm. or a drill sergeant like pulls back into military posture when they're yep. being looked at, you know, they really shoulders are back and neck is back, but you know, that's not where they live. Right. You know, that's just because that's their idea of what, and, and, and sometimes that's not the correct posture for them anyway. Right. Yep. Cause they're too, they flattened out their neck. They flattened out their thoracic spine and they've created a lot of tension that they don't need. So it's, it's, it, there's that little piece too. just what is their belief system about what's correct? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Something else to think about that I want to throw out here in science, we have something called the learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have someone do something for the first time that they've never done before, yeah. their brain doesn't know how to do it. Nope. So you have them do a squat and they've never squatted before in their life. Yes, they've gotten up and down off the chair and all that sort of thing, but they've never done a formal squat. Right. So never thought about it that way. Right. So you ask them to do it and it looks horrible. Well, in a month from now, after you've had them do squats semi-regularly, suddenly they do it a whole lot better. So, you know, judging that assessment, when I was working, you know, doing lab work at the University of Hawaii. We would have everybody come in and perform the test where I did something called the Wingate test, which is a maximum exertion test on a bicycle. We would have every single person come in and the first time they did it, we would mark everything down. We would make it seem like they were really doing it for real and they were, but it was to get that learning curve out of the way because every single mm -hmm. person to a person got better the second time. Yeah. So we just told them we have to do it twice. And yeah. they're like, oh, okay. So you're going to come back next week and we're going to do it again. Okay. Perfect. But that second time, now we actually recorded the information. Yeah. And there was a big difference. Yeah. And that was that was sort of a real eye-opener for me. So when you talk about assessor sizes, there have been many times that I've taken a, an exercise that I would use in a, as an assessment. Uh but as you teach it and as they get better at it, well, guess what? The next time I assess them, man, you, you've improved. Well, of course they've improved. Right. They've gotten better. They've gotten more efficient. Right. You know, motor skills have, have occurred. And, and if I'm teaching something as an assessor size, I'm trying to see what they do without, without direction, without coaching, without knowing what they exactly. should do. I mean, that, that's kind of, that, that's what I think of the assessor piece as opposed to the exercise piece. You know, yes. once I start coaching it and working on it and bringing their awareness to it, it becomes an exercise. It, it may be an assessment in a sense, but it's no longer the same that I, I would start with. <clears throat> yes, yeah. absolutely. And that's something <clears throat> to keep in mind too, is when you are assessing somebody for the first time, don't over cue. See what they want to do naturally. Yep. You know, because if you do over cue, you're changing what they're doing. So if yeah. I have someone squat and I want to see whether or not they shift from side to side, forward or back, do they have internal rotation of the femurs? All these kind of things are something that I'm going to look at with that. And we'll go into, you know, different exercise, uh, assessor sizes at another date. But you're looking at all these things. Well, if I'm telling them how to do it properly and you want to keep your knees apart, now balance on both feet. Now, as you do, I've changed everything. Yep. No, but if, I, if, I, if I'm doing this assessment, it's like, okay, I'm just going to have you squat. And now if they, if they look at me like, what is a squat? I might just kind of do, just, I mean, I might, I might do one, demo I might it. Just, you know, yep. just, I might just demo it pretty quickly. Just like, you know, just come on down like this. And I, I yep. that's all I'm going to do. Um, uh, because that's, that's what I want to see. I want to see what their, what their strategy is. Exactly. Exactly. Now, 
And that's really what we want to look at. Just today's assessment is a snapshot of the person in front of me today. Mm -hmm. It's going to be different next week. It's going to be different next month. And hopefully it's going to be different six months from now when we've worked with them for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's all it is, is that snapshot. And a reassessment is just taking a look at maybe, maybe take a look quickly at their posture, you know, where, where has it changed? And again, it doesn't have to be formal, but you do want to take a look at and say, oh, okay, I see some changes here, you know, where you were here. Now you're here. Uh, or, you know, when they are squatting, you know, I'm thinking of a client that, you know, I had doing squats and she was, man, she could not control her femurs. They were all over the place. So I gave her a little band around her knees so she could actually feel a little tension. And again, it was a light band. It was just to yeah. give her something feedback. to feel feedback, yeah, feedback is all I was looking for, yeah. but her squat looked great. And I will assume when I take a look at it again, without the band in four weeks or something that she's probably adjusted enough and learned the exercise enough and created stability in her hips and her pelvis and everything else that she won't need that anymore. And that's yeah. the goal. Yeah. So again, looking at that and being able to reassess it and realize, okay, now we can move on or do something different. Awesome. Yeah. So partial assessment, you know, we, we definitely use it. It's definitely, um, in it's a tool. some ways, it's a tool. And I would almost say, like, as part of our alphabet, if you think about all the tools in our toolkit of our mm -hmm. alphabet, it may be A, B, C, and D. Yeah. Right? Uh, like, it is part of the alphabet for sure. And it's a very useful part of the alphabet. Maybe it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really even call it the vowels. It's just like a few letters. Right? I'm it's like, a couple no, letters. It's not that valuable. <clears throat> uh, but, it's, but it's a key part of what we do. And, and again, that's oftentimes where you can reassess and see the changes, where clients yep. see the changes. And, and maybe posture is their critical issue. And then you're really going to work on it. Maybe there's other things that are more their critical issue or other things you need to address to get their posture to improve. So it's also looking at what just what is the role their posture is playing in their situation, in their condition. Mm -hmm in their function or their activity, you know, maybe yep. critically important to what they're trying to do. It may be that that's not the critical thing. The critical thing is endurance or it's mobility or it's, you know, something else that really is the underlying uh, limitation maybe for them. So just make sure it's part of your toolkit, but just one of your many tools. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is going to be a uh, part one of two. And I say that because I think our next uh, time we talk about posture, mm -hmm. uh, which will probably be next week, uh, let's talk about the kinetic chain. Let's talk about yeah. what muscles actually affect those changes. Because now that you know, okay, here's what I'm looking at. Here's what I might see. Okay. What are we going to look at now? What, what exercises and what muscles and why, when I work this muscle, does it affect that postural change? Oh, that's interesting. I'm working my hips, but suddenly my shoulders are further back and I'm rotating better. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the kinetic chain, how yeah, it which, can affect posture. Yeah. Which joints and which muscles change yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So again, part one of two, we'll hit that next week. <laughs> so you'll have a little bit deeper understanding of where to go and what to do with your client once you see where their posture is. And what, what changes can we make? And maybe what changes should we make? We also have a really exciting guest coming up, um, Karina yes. Beck, um, who is a specialist in scoliosis and has a scolio uh, Pilates program that she runs, um, is going to be joining us as a guest. So we're really excited to have her. And just to talk about scoliosis, which many of you have requested, which is a hot topic for sure. Yep. And depending <clears> on when this, yeah. and depends on when this lands, honestly, <laughs> I'm thinking of pushing her up. So we may actually put this her maybe before. after her. <laughs> this may be after her. There's this a possibility be because yeah. scoliosis is such a big deal. And again, we just talked about assessing posture. Scoliosis yeah. is huge in the postural community. Absolutely. So it's something that we really want to touch on. And we wanted to bring a professional on someone who deals with it on a regular basis, that that's their gig so yeah. that we can learn a lot more about it. So stay tuned for that. And Maybe it was before that. So if you hadn't heard it and it did come out before, go back in the archives and check it out. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, like I said, people have been hitting us up about scoliosis for a while and they do so on our email, movingconvos 
at gmail.com is the best way to get in touch with us. You can check out our social media pages, uh, Moving Convos is on Instagram, um, Moving Conversations on Facebook. You can also see Nora's and my uh, personal uh, socials. If you go to the show page, it has all of them listed down. Uh, or just on Instagram, type in our names, will pop up usually. Uh, I'm under Fit for Life DC. I think you're Nora. St. John. Seven. Something so, like that. Yes. Something like that. So, yeah. So, check us out. We're going to be posting a lot. Things are going to be changing over the next few weeks, social media wise. Hopefully, things are going to, you're going to see a lot more of us, and that'll be nice. So, please like, subscribe, uh, comment. That's really important. Comment. If you like something, say, I dig this like it, love this part of it, or would love to see more on this. The comments really help in the algorithm so we can get seen by more and more people. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks guys. So for Nora St. John and Brian Ritchie, we'll see you next week. <laughs>